All right, welcome again to the session on differential privacy. Uh, we have four very exciting talks lined up today covering the intersection of differential privacy with uh, reasoning about the privacy parameter epsilon, to thinking about the non-interactive notions of differential privacy, thinking about composition of differential privacy, as well as its intersection with cryptographic primitives. Uh, so first up, we have uh, uh, Professor Sarah Krebel from University of Richmond talking about epsilon for privacy as a service. Thank you. Um, so I'm Sarah Crable, and today I'm going to be giving a differential privacy talk about mechanism design for choosing this privacy parameter epsilon as a function of the data in settings where a company is trying to offer differential privacy as a service in addition to other services that it's already offering. So the basic premise of this talk is that there's this fundamental tension between the usefulness of data and also the privacy that we can protect when we're using the data. And I do mean that in a general data privacy sense beyond uh, differential privacy. If you just think about the extreme, if I give all of my data to someone with no privacy concerns what whatsoever, they can extract a lot of information from this data. But of course, I'm giving up a lot of privacy in, pre in uh, presenting all of my data in the clear. On the other end of the spectrum, I can never give any of my data up if that were possible, and then nothing could ever be learned from that. So with differential privacy, which is going to be the focus of this talk, um, we have this beautiful kind of built-in dial that allows us to tinker with this privacy accuracy trade-off, and that's the privacy parameter epsilon. So um, I'll kind of do a little crash course in differential privacy on the next slide, which will probably be the first of four nearly identical crash courses on differential privacy you're going to get in the next hour. Um, but the, uh, the idea here is that what Epsilon is doing is it's enforcing a privacy requirement. And the smaller we set Epsilon, the more noise we add, the more privacy we get. But more, more noise also means uh, more error. And so that's worse accuracy. So the two questions that this talk is going to consider is, how can we define privacy so that this epsilon isn't something that we're fixing a priori, but it's something that we can look at the data and then figure out how much noise to add for privacy? So currently, the um, notion of differential privacy doesn't really have this variable epsilon, or maybe it does, but only for like different people in certain settings. And so this is going to be a new conceptual idea. The reason for the, or the motivation for this conceptual idea uh, concretely is going to be that we're going to design a mechanism that actually privately determines what level of epsilon we might want to set for a, different, for a given scenario where we're interested in how much people care about privacy and how that weighs, um, how, how we should balance that with our concern for accuracy as well. And if we're asking people how much they care about something, we need to actually incentivize them to, um, to tell us the truth. So that's going to be a key. Um, a key constraint in the design of this mechanism. Okay, so your first uh, crash course on differential privacy. The setting is that we have several data subjects and somebody who wants to analyze their data. The data subjects give their data to a mechanism and the mechanism does some differential privacy magic um, and it responds to an analyst's query by adding some noise to that. So there, that can be done in some type of complicated way. Now, these mechanisms typically are parameterized by this value epsilon. And we say that a mechanism is epsilon differentially private uh, for a particular value of epsilon if for any neighboring databases, and so neighboring databases are databases that differ on only one person's entry, and any event that we might be looking for that's a signal of something of interest to us, the probability of that event occurring on one of those databases is within e to the epsilon multiplicative factor of the probability of that event occurring on a neighboring database. And so I have the delta in here. Um, if you are not a differential privacy person, you can pretty much just ignore the delta. Um, I'm going to basically, for the sake of uh, clarity, be more or less ignoring the delta throughout this talk. You can think of it as something that is non-zero but very, very small. So um, the kind of most fundamental example of a mechanism that achieves differential privacy is this Laplace mechanism where we say we're going to take the database, compute the value of the query on the database that's not private at all, but we're going to add a little bit of Laplace noise, and a Laplace distribution is one of these pointy things that we see here. Um, and the amount of noise, so the parameter that we're passing into the Laplace, that's going to determine how uh, narrow or fat this is, is going to be proportional to the sensitivity of the query, so that's how much it can change 
change when we change uh, one entry in the database, divided by our desired privacy parameter epsilon. So as we send epsilon smaller, we're going to get a fatter distribution and we get more privacy. And this me mechanism is epsilon zero differentially private. Okay, so um, just to kind of package this and look at this a little more graphically so we can move on to the new definition that we're going to be working with. Um, again, our privacy setting is we have some me mechanism. We have an epsilon that we're telling the mechanism in advance. We collect the data. We add some noise. And so what this um, depiction shows is what the distribution of outputs of the mechanism might look like on a sequence of databases that we, where we are altering uh, the database one entry at a time. So we start with some database over here. The true answer is here. Then we maybe add an entry, for example, or change an entry, and the true uh, query answer increases. But we're adding the same amount of noise in each of these scenarios. So now consider that this isn't just some random count of things in the database, but maybe the thing that we're interested in calculating is how much, for example, people care about privacy. So maybe the sequence of databases is representing a world where people really don't care very much about privacy, and then we're transitioning into a world where people do care a lot about privacy. So what we ideally would like is we would like the privacy accuracy trade-off to be different over in this realm than in this realm. But because we're adding the same amount of noise to each of these databases, that's not what's happening. So this is the picture that we more would be going for. In a world, in the um, green and blue world, where people don't care much about privacy, I would rather be adding less noise and getting more accuracy, allowing these two distributions pairwise to differ more. But in this world where people care about privacy, I want the distributions to be fatter and closer to each other, and I'm uh, OK with getting more error there. <clears throat> so what we're going to do to the definition to allow for this nice picture is something that mathematically is very simple. Um, but it allows for this very different conceptualization of what it means for something to be differentially private, we're going to endogenize that parameter epsilon. So before, in the standard definition, we have to specify what epsilon is, and then that parameterizes our um, notion of privacy before we've ever looked at the data. Now we're going to think about mechanisms that are selecting their value of epsilon after seeing the data. Potentially, they're selecting it as some very normal function of this data. Maybe, I mean, maybe this selection is going to be randomized or totally arbitrary. Um, but what we're doing is we're saying instead of for all databases subject to a particular value of epsilon, we're going to say first specify which two neighboring pairs you're talking about, then consider what epsilon that mechanism chooses on those databases. And that epsilon, and potentially the delta as well, is going to enforce the privacy requirement for that pair of databases. So I want to pause before I move on and ask if there are any questions, because this is kind of, this is the graphic and this is the swap in definitions that I want to be your main takeaway from this. Yeah? So is looking at the data in order to select your epsilon parameter consume some of the privacy budget? Potentially. Yes, so, um, so if looking at the data is going to affect what the outcome output of the mechanism is, then that should be captured in, in this picture here. And so this is a one-dimensional case. If you're outputting multiple pieces of information, then collectively all of that information needs to satisfy that privacy guarantee. Good question. So this is a very cartoony one-dimensional picture, but we're going to eventually have to think about things in higher dimensions. Thanks. OK, so here's a warm-up mechanism that incorporates these ideas. Um, and it's just sort of slightly more formalizing what I was talking about before. If the goal of this setting is actually to estimate how much the population is concerned with privacy while also offering this endogenous notion of privacy, um, then what we're going we're gonna to want is we're going to want epsilon to be decreasing with the overall concern. So the way the mechanism works is I ask everybody how much they care about privacy. They either don't care about privacy and they're a zero, or they care about privacy and they're a one. And then I pick this value of epsilon that is decreasing as people care more about privacy. And then this delta is also going to be necessary. I'll give a second description of that. But basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick this level of epsilon and then just do the Laplace mechanism with that value of epsilon as my parameter. So the output of this mechanism, if we're talking about a world where we have almost all zeros versus a world where we have almost all ones, is our noise is increasing as the number of uh, ones are increasing. 
And so for those of you who are kind of interested in pure versus um, epsilon delta privacy, you can actually kind of look at this picture and recognize that we really do need this delta. It's going to be very um, small, but, uh, but it's necessary because if we think about over here, these two um, adjacent databases, since their variance is different, if we're looking at outliers, um, the probability of seeing an outlier on the right uh, most uh, on the rightmost distribution is going to get arbitrarily larger multiplicatively than uh, the one right next to it, but since it's an outlier, it's ha it occurs with a very small probability. Okay, so now I want to start talking about the incentives involved in choosing what value of epsilon um, we should pick. So the first perspective is one that's been used by much of the literature on um, kind of commoditizing privacy, viewing data as, as something of value and privacy as something of value. Um, it's more of a perspective of privacy loss as being something that's costly, whereas data is something that is valuable. And so because of that, we're thinking about the analyst being forced to pay the data subject and getting the data in return. And so you're going to pay the subject something that has to do with how much privacy you're going to offer, and that's going to correspond to how uh, valuable or invaluable the data or not valuable the data is for you. So it turns out that if you um, set up a bunch of things, uh, you know, with more detail than I'll have time to get into, there is this uh, seemingly really strong negative result that says that there does not exist a mechanism that can offer non-trivial accuracy and also can adequately compensate data subjects for their privacy loss unless you're willing to spend an infinite amount of money. So that seems like we're sort of dead in the water, but I do want to mention that there's an important catch here, and that catch is that we're using the old notion of differential privacy where we have to pick one value of epsilon, and that, um, and that specifies the privacy requirement for every possible set of databases. So in particular, in this setting, if everybody cares a lot about privacy, then I'm going to have to pay people a lot of money for their data, and I'm going to have to give a very small value of epsilon. So with this very small value of epsilon, this is sort of my overall uh, picture, when in fact I want this picture that we talked about before. So if we're um, using the endogenous privacy definition, we no longer have this impossibility result. So that's kind of an interesting thing in and of itself. But now I want to switch gears to a different perspective where money is actually flowing in the other direction. And so I'm not saying that this is a better or worse perspective. I think they're applicable um, in, in, two, in, in sort of different scenarios. So the first scenario, perspective one, makes a lot of sense if you're thinking about being somebody who's, um, who's doing market research and you're surveying people and you need to compensate them for their time and for their data. I think the second scenario is actually very applicable in a lot of real world situations that we live in where the people who are consuming our data are actually producers in some sort of standard economic sense. So think about um, Netflix or Amazon where you're actually paying them and in paying them you're also voluntarily giving up your data. You're telling Netflix um, what movies you like to watch, you're telling Amazon what your um, purchase behavior is, and on top of that, you're paying Netflix to let you stream movies and you're paying Amazon to deliver packages to your door. So this is sort of where we live without data being crossed out. And so now what I'm saying is maybe for some of these companies, it makes sense to have a premium privacy service that they're actually charging their consumers for. And this ended up being really topical because this week for Prime Day, um, Amazon actually said that in addition to all of the data that they collect from you, um, if they'll give you $10 if you're willing to let them collect even more information about where you're browsing online. There's no differential privacy there yet, but now there can be. So um, this privacy market that we're going to add on to this says, I'm not going to give you data in the clear. I'm going to give this differentially private mechanism my data. And I'm also going to pay you a premium for the privacy guarantee that I get in return. And then the producer gets the noisy statistics rather than the raw data. So if we're talking now in this very economic context, the question is going to be, what is going to uh, be required in order to incentivize consumers to truthfully report their value for privacy? Um, because if privacy is something that is going to be endogenized by the mechanism, that choice should depend on how much people say they want privacy. And if we just give everybody more privacy for saying that they want more privacy, and there's no kind of counterbalancing privacy premium, then people are going to lie about how much they care about privacy. 
Okay, so the perspective that I want to adopt in considering this economic question is one of privacy as being a public good. And so now I mean public good, uh, not, in the, not in the way that we use privacy in the privacy literature, but in the economics context. So a public good is one where I can't block person A from using the good any more than I can block person B. So lots of goods are private goods. Um, if I give you a sandwich, then you don't get to have the sandwich. But if I'm producing, if I'm uh, creating a public park, then everybody gets to enjoy that public par park equally. So privacy level now is going to be the thing that we think of as being the public good, but if we go to the more generic sense, like we think of a, a public good as being a park or something like this, this is a problem that's been studied by economists for a long time. And so in a series of papers, um, Vickery, Clark, Glo Groves, and Ledyard came up with this mechanism that says, here's how we can incentivize people to tell us how much they want parks, and um, then we will pay some producer to maintain these parks, and we'll pick an optimal amount of parks in, in a city to, um, to, uh, to produce. <laughs> so um, in this mechanism, I'm not kind of going to go through the details of the math, um, but the math that's here says we're going to choose this level of public good in a way that maximizes consumer surplus, and it turns out that that's going to be um, Pareto efficient. And um, in, choosing that public, in choosing the level of public good to produce, we're also going to select a payment that's going to be required for each person based on the amount that they say that they valued the good. So I'm going to give the people a survey. They're going to say how much they care about the good. And then I'm going to tell them, well, here are your taxes to pay for that good. And the payment is set up in such a way that nobody can do better by lying about um, no, nobody, can, nobody can enjoy the park minus their payment uh, more by lying about how much they actually enjoy the good. So this is sort of the, um, this, this is the, the core of how we're going to uh, add this market dynamic on top of our privacy setting that we're looking at. So moving back to the privacy setting, um, what this, uh, what this privacy market does is it endogenizes the choice of epsilon by viewing that choice of epsilon as um, a choice of what's the optimal amount of this public good of privacy to produce. Um, and I kind of didn't mention this on the last slide, but the reason that we're thinking of privacy as being a public good is because in this central model of privacy, I'm adding noise to this overall aggregate statistic, and the amount of noise that I'm adding to the aggregate statistic has the same privacy implication for everybody. Um, it would be a different scenario if we're talking about local privacy, and I'm happy if people have questions to um, address that at the end. Um, but what this uh, mechanism does is it asks people, in addition to handing over their data, to say how much they actually care about privacy. And it um, computes this optimal level of privacy. And it computes these incentive compatible payments, which correspond to the premium that each person is going to pay for privacy. So people are going to pay different premiums for privacy, even though they're all getting the same privacy. So then we're going to take some mechanism that's differentially private in the standard sense, meaning you take the data and you specify in advance an epsilon level, and then you get some noisy statistic. The only difference, the only thing that's kind of um, a, a catch that we need to worry about, and this is related to the, um, to the question that I got earlier, is what do we need to, do we need to be concerned about the fact that this level of epsilon itself, knowledge of that level of epsilon, is private information? And the answer is yes, we do need to be concerned. Because if a producer is offering a uh, privacy service uh, as a premium, we have to pay that producer for that privacy service. And paying the producer as a function of epsilon reveals that, um, reveals that value of epsilon. And so, um, there's like math involved, but basically all we're going to do is we're going to take the amount of money that that producer needs from this market and add a little bit of noise. And if we add noise in the appropriate way, then we get our main result that this mechanism is endogenously differentially private. The payment structure um, encourages consumers to truthfully report their preferences. And the accuracy of this mechanism with respect to the original query of interest is just inherited from this, um, from this differentially private mechanism that we're wrapped around. And then um, if we make appropriate assumptions, not very strong assumptions, about how much people value privacy, then we also get the Pareto efficiency and individual rationality. And what individual rationality essentially means is that uh, the consumers would rather have this privacy as a premium than not at all. 
So the two takeaways then um, are that uh, we've reconceptualized differential privacy in this context that epsilon should be data dependent, um, allowing for this uh, kind of differential, differential um, level of noise being added in, uh, for different databases. And then we've, off we've offered a privacy market that's very general in that anything that you can do differentially privately, you can wrap uh, this public goods allocation mechanism around it and now do it in such a way that epsilon is um, a function of the data itself. Thanks. We have time for questions. <laughs> Sorry, so I think this is related to the same question as before. So epsilon star at the end is revealed, right? Uh, a noisy epsilon star. So, right, so um, the outputs that go down, <laughs> This is sort of something that the mechanism is committing to, but it's not something that it's publishing. What the mechanism is publishing to the producer is how much money they get from this privacy as a service, and that's the reason for adding this noise. Okay. Was that the end of your question? Did, okay. Uh, I just had a question about the, the market mechanism. Um, it seems to me that in a lot of contexts where you'd want differential privacy, uh, the people who need the privacy the most are the outliers. And there's often uh, they're in the minority. So I'm just, maybe I'm misunderstanding how the market works, but if everybody gets together and sort of jointly selects a privacy level, doesn't that mean that the outliers don't get to pick the privacy? So you'd expect it to be low? Yeah, so the outliers are influencing privacy in the same way that everyone else is influencing privacy. But um, in the central privacy model, there's one value of epsilon. And so if I have several people who care a lot about privacy, but most of the people don't care very much, then whatever this consumer surplus maximizing amount of epsilon is, that's the one epsilon that everyone gets. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Um, I, find, I find the idea of valuating uh, data privacy in this manner like really, really interesting to, to the domain of applied differential privacy. I guess my, my concern as a follow-up to the, to the previous question is by using this kind of a self-report mechanism, the respondents are still susceptible to cognitive bias in terms of the way that they report. It also presumes a level of understanding of the threat model that I find very difficult to accept. Um, I guess just thinking out loud, have you explored the possibility of uh, using actual market incentives, so the value that is being paid for private data as a surrogate for privacy valuation? So more specific profiles are worth more to advertisers currently, and that is data that can be collected objectively, possibly, and I have no idea, satisfying the, the desire of this approach. Um. Yeah, so I guess the first thing I'll say is this is completely theoretical at this point. Um, and I'm not a psychologist or sociologist, so I probably wouldn't be the one to figure out how to design such a study. I think it's a really interesting idea, and I hope that uh, people will kind of run with that. Um, another thing that I'll say, which kind of is related to the previous question, is that again, this is talking about pri the central model of privacy. And the central model of privacy is that everyone gets the same level of epsilon. Now, these companies that actually are doing differential privacy in practice are doing that in the local model. So you randomize your own, ish, yeah. <laughs> you, look, you randomize your own data before you pass it in. and. Um, and this picture is completely different in that case. In the local model of privacy, privacy is no longer a, um, a public good, and so the incentives are completely realigned. I think it would be very interesting to, um, to, to move this kind of idea over to that local setting to allow more granularity in what you can offer consumers. All right, let's thank our speaker once again. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, T. Chanyaswad, who will be talking to us about uh, non-interactive non mechanisms for differential privacy. Uh, T. was a PhD student at uh, Princeton University and is currently leading a machine learning team in, in Thailand uh, in a company called KB Technologies.
Oh, this is the wrong one. Oh, I don't have the adapter, unfortunately. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Wait. Uh, this. No, that's a USB C, isn't it? Yeah. No. No, not as well. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what type of adapter do you need? Uh, anything that works with Mac. Mm -hmm. SP, I like guess. Display port. What is it? Display port is what it's called. Yeah. yeah. Or VGA to HDMI, if anyone might have. Uh, could we could we borrow the laptop of follow-up presenters for this slide? We can yeah, switch order. I, uh, the next person. Uh, David is currently a PhD student at uh, ETH Zurich, uh, broadly interested in machine learning. Uh, and uh, in addition to the theoretical uh, aspect of machine learning in terms of differential privacy, he's also excited about the programming dimension of implementing uh, ML algorithms. Uh, and, and David is also currently looking for an internship. Thanks, David. Um, thank you for listening to my talk, Privacy Loss Classes, the Central Limit Theorem in Differential Privacy. I'm David Sommer, and this is joint work with Sebastian Meiser and Svanja Mohammadi. So, when I arrived in Stockholm last week, it was quite sunny, but at the night it got really cold, freezing, and there was a an radiator, uh, which wasn't working when I turned it on, because it's midsummer, obviously. So I was freezing, buying uh, an electric heater, which uses a lot of power, but unfortunately, the power meter was smart, so sending detailed use st statistics to my landlord, which, uh, well, wants more money. Wouldn't it be nice if there is some way to blur whether I have used that power or maybe the next tenant? Unfortunately, due to particular interests, such techniques are not really implemented by now, but maybe later. But still, the core ID uh, of blurring the uh, inputs that lead to specific outputs is heavily used in privacy and in differential privacy especially. Differential privacy, we all know, is uh, used, for example, in um, stochastic gradient descent to noise it, or, well, this is a reference to the talk that should have been before me, um, synthesizing uh, differentially private uh, data. But in the end, there are uh, many definitions of differential privacy, for example, epsilon differen differential privacy, concentrated differential privacy, Rene differential privacy, and even two versions of epsilon delta differential privacy. And they all do somewhat the same, and it's really confusing, but as privacy in the end boils down very often to statistics, minor differences have a huge influence in uh, uh, impact in, in what, what, what is uh, the privacy loss in the end. That's what I'm going to talk about. I will connect these different differential privacy definitions in an easy, understandable manner. I will then show that we can use this concept to estimate privacy leakage under independent composition. I will show exact formula for a Gaussian noise. Um, and I can show that, you, that my mechanism allows to compare uh, different mechanisms using privacy loss classes, will, which will be then straightforward by then. So I started the definition we all know, slash hate. Uh, it has already been introduced. so. I just would like to stress the fact that these probabilities can be dissected in the, in the atomic events um, of the output range of a mechanism N, so we can look at them individually, and I will make heavy use of this concept. So please note that uh, these two equations here are equivalent. We just divide by uh, the right um, uh, probability and then take the logarithm, and this motivates a very famous concept uh, called the privacy loss distribution, which uh, is uh, for all atomic input O in the output range of M allows to uh, calculate the privacy loss. What does that mean? For this? this is for specific inputs. And as an example, when we have additive noise here on the x-axis, there are the atomic events O, and we have a base signal which the mechanism cannot influence. All it can do is add delay. For example, let's say these are seconds, as an example, we add no delay, or we add uh, one second with a certain probability, or two, and so on. And the um, mechanism here is with second input in green, has the base signal one second later. And for simplicity, we add the same noise uh, as an example, and now we compute individually the privacy loss. Here, the quotient uh, for the first is two, 
And uh, when we take the logarithm, we get 0.69. And we do this again and again and again and again. And um, there is a special case when the second probability is zero, we define it to be plus infinity. And if it's the other way around, we define it to be uh, minus infinity. Um, this is very technical. I will make it even more complex because now I'm using this to reorder the events of the first red distribution to make what I call the privacy loss distribution. This is the concept which will simplify a lot of things I will explain later in the talk. So here, as an example, the first the atomic event one has a loss of 0.69. We will move the probability mass there. And with the second thing as well, as well. And if we have two events with the same um, privacy loss, we will just stack them on top of each other. And we have an infinity pocket because sometimes yeah, we have uh, distinguishing events, as we call it, where the privacy loss is infinity. I would, would like to mention that the minus infinity bucket is always empty because the probability is always zero that we have this, uh, but it's there for mathematical completeness. And we can do the same if we switch the inputs to the privacy loss function, uh, which we call dual private privacy loss distribution. And these are equivalent, there is a bijection, um, but to understand it, it's more simple when I show both. I would like to stress that different inputs lead to different privacy loss distributions, but in practice, very often, uh, you can reduce the privacy analysis to one pair of input. What can we do with this privacy loss distribution? Now, for now, let's assume that there, uh, the infinity buckets are not there. Um, this we call inner PLD. Remember that, I will need it later. If I now add an epsilon here on the x, uh, this is a value on the x-axis, then all the the privacy loss of all the events is smaller than this epsilon, so we get epsilon differential privacy very easily. How about if we have infinity buckets? Yeah, then we have a delta. Then, of course, yeah, we don't have epsilon differential privacy anymore. We can even reduce the epsilon, th which then makes the delta bigger. But this is a very intuitive privacy definition, which is called epsilon delta probabilistic differential privacy, which just states that the um, um, the amount of uh, probability which a privacy loss bigger than epsilon is smaller than delta. This is very common, but there is a problem. You, it's not closed on the post-processing. That means you can um, make mechanisms that break this property. This is then solved by epsilon delta um, approximate differential privacy, which is the same as epsilon differential privacy plus a delta. Um, yeah, it's just definitions throwing around. What we actually do instead, as before, just summing up all the uh, individual bars of the diagram, which are bigger than epsilon, uh, we weight them in a smart way, and uh, which with a function between one and zero. And this, when we evaluate this delta, which is the tightest delta that fulfills the equation you see here, if we make a graph, um, we get something like this. We call this uh, uh, ADP graph. I would advocate in future not to just look at a single epsilon delta pair, but on the whole graph because it contains much more information about the actual privacy loss of, the, of a mechanism. Here on the x-axis we have the, the epsilon and the delta is on the y-axis. We have shown in our work that this is equivalent to the PLD. If you have a finite number of atomic events, this is technical detail, but both sides have equal expressiveness. Now I get to the next subject, Rene differential privacy. Um, this is heavily used in machine learning because it behaves very well on the composition. And to illustrate how easy uh, it is to understand, this is the privacy loss distribution without infinity buckets here. If we exponentiate the x-axis um, and we calculate the moments of the distribution, maybe you recall statistics, moments somehow tell something about the shape. Um, and if we take the logarithm of it because we are cool and put the interfinitions and so on, we get this expression, don't try to understand it. But the experts will immediately see, oh, that's a Rene divergence. So, boom, defining a new alpha, we get Rene um, a differential privacy, which where the epsilon here in this definition just uh, limits the growth of the moments, which somehow shape the tail of the distribution. Here as well, we show that the PLD uh, with the formula above directly leads to a sequence of uh, Rini divergences. And if you have the sequence, we can show that it, the other direction works as well under certain conditions, technical stuff usually works out in most cases. So here we have equivalence as well. 
So to make it, uh, to summarize a little bit, uh, when you have a mechanism with two inputs, we get the PLD, we get the Rini divergence, uh, differential privacy and the approximate, and we have shown equivalence. So if you look at the full graphs, these definitions are equivalent. That's the uh, first takeaway I would uh, like to take you home from my talk. And now I get to the next subject, independent composition. Um, if you have the privacy loss, now I'm very sorry, I have to show a little bit math uh, to illustrate why this is the case. When you have um, composition of a mechanism M and M prime and you want to calculate the privacy loss, then this is the definition. So you invoke them independently after each other. Because independence, we can look at the probabilities uh, individually and the multiplication of it. Yeah, high school math, I hope you remember. Uh, you can make a, uh, a plus in there and this is again the definition of the new privacy loss. So co independent composition is actually the um, is a uh, addition of random variables. That means this is a convolution, maybe you remember that. So composition is convolution of the inner PLD because infinity buckets not really included here. You remember inner PLD is this. And there we can do a lot of cool things with it. Because maybe you remember convolution. I hope you remember the title of the talk, huh? Central Limit Theorem Apply, which as a short recap, if you have the mean and the variance of the inner PLD under independent composition, this converges against a normal distribution, which parameters we can predict. And it converges usually quite quickly, mathematically, not that fast. But as an example, what that means when we have Laplace noise here, this is the common literature example. Um, two inputs, uh, the talk before Sarah showed the same example with Laplace noise. The PLD here in blue looks like this. The red dotted line is the Gaussian with the same mean and variance in the privacy loss space. And after three compositions, four invocations, so there's off by one between composition and invocation, it looks already like this, closer. And after 32, we are very close to a Gaussian distribution. So now we, we, if we include the infinity bucket as well, we can even predict how it behaves, which leads to the insight that with the mean, the variance and the infinity bucket of the privacy loss distribution, you can characterize the convergence under independent composition. And this is very valuable if you have a high number of composition where other approximations usually fail. And it's even applicable to non-equal uh, mechanisms as there are central limit theorem for, for different distributions under certain constraints and so on. This is takeaway number two. Okay, now uh, if you are practical and you haven't listened until now, the, um, if you have Laplace noise and think about mm, can I use different noise to add in my mechanism where I invoke my mechanism many, many times, yeah, use Gaussian noise because they, it, this noise has half the variance of the Laplace distribution, but they have almost, almost uh, identical uh, privacy uh, mean and variance. The only difference is the delta of the Gauss Gaussian distribution. But as you see here, uh, with increasing number of compositions, you, with 100, 150, you already reach a region where cryptographers consider um, deltas to be negligible. So 2 to uh, 100 minus 28. This is already a very small delta. So use Gaussian noise because it has a higher utility than Laplacian um, under composition. And this, depending on your setup and what you need, but the rule of thumb with a under composition, after that you should use Gaussian noise. This is takeaway number three. And now I'm going to talk about Gaussian mechanism. If you have Gaussian mechanism, as I have shown before, the Laplace mechanism, in um, the, with a certain uh, standard deviation. If the PLD turns out to be again a Gaussian, and maybe you remember the convolution of a Gaussian is a Gaussian again. Oh yeah, we can predict the parameters uh, very easily in the, of the Gaussian PLD from the parameters of the, the mechanism we apply. And then we get again a Gaussian in the prob uh, probability loss space. And the cool thing is if we go and compute the delta, the uh, approximate differential private data, this is this uh, area you see here, we have an ac uh, exact formula. 
And this is straightforward to compute. You don't need to do convolution or everything. And this is highly valuable if you have like a million compositions, like um, mixed networks or something like this would have. And uh, oh, yeah, here uh, ERFC, that's the complementary error function, the integral of the Gauss function. Uh, there, it's, it's efficiently computable. There are uh, libraries that allow you to do this. This is the, uh, in the GNU scientific library. You can uh, very accurate functions that allow you to do that. And I would like to mention that we are not the first. Concurrent work has same, found the same formula when looking into the uh, calibration of Gaussian noise. But in our work, as all uh, privacy loss distributions converge against the normal distribution, we can, for a high number of uh, composition, predict the, uh, the approximate differential privacy delta easily by just saying, yeah, it looks somewhat like a Gaussian. Mathematically, this is a little bit improper. But still, this is takeaway number four. Um, I would like to summarize. I have introduced a new concept we call privacy loss distribution that simplifies that the, these privacy, um, differential privacy definition. We have conditioned equivalence between uh, Rene differential privacy, the privacy loss distribution, and the approximate differential privacy. We have composition for arbitrary mechanisms under certain con uh, constraints. Um, yeah, use Gaussian noise if you do it in practical way. I have shown that um, there is an exact, exact formula uh, against which everything converges. And in the paper, we apply bounds to it now due to time constraints. How much minutes do I have? I think you have some time. OK. Um, yeah, I have a backup slide on that. Uh, yeah, we have uh, put bounds on, on, uh, on uh, what we have found. And we have even an additional bound which uh, uses the Markov inequ uh, inequality like uh, Rene divergence does. This is a very technical thing. I'm not going to talk about it. Yeah, um, questions later. So what I would like to talk about are the bounds we have found. Uh, here, uh, try to ignore most of the thing, the plot here, this is the epsilon value. And here, for each epsilon, you have a delta value. And the, um, this is Gaussian versus Gaussian mixture. As a stochastic gradient descent does its privacy evaluation, it's actually this, the paper uh, 2016 uh, SMP. Um, and uh, here, what you see, probability buckets, this is a numeric implementation, which is more or less the real value. It's numerical. That's the reason it fails here. Um, and this is the baseline of the bounds we have evaluated. Here, the black one, you see the exact Gaussian formula, which for 2 to 16, so 60,000 um, uh, repetition uh, of noise, it's already very close to the real value. And what we have applied, uh, we have applied distance bounds to the, here, uh, this is the normal distribution, and this is the convolution of the, uh, the privacy loss distribution and the barrier sin, maybe I've heard of it, applies distance. Problem, it shrinks very slowly, square root of n with the number of invocations, which makes it very bad. And there are tail estimations, Naga if it's called, not much better. Uh, but this is future work, actually to find better bounds to approximate the, the uh, closeness to our exact uh, Gaussian formula. Yeah, and I think my time is over. So thank you, and uh, questions? Questions for David? <laughs> well, while, you're, while you're pondering, uh, what question to ask David? Maybe I can, I can take the lead in one. Uh, you have a, a plot here on the application to differentially private uh, SGD. Yeah. You hinted that uh, the close connections to analysis of any differential privacy. Uh, so, could in the in the literature on differentially private deep learning, uh, there it seems like there's still room to improve the privacy utility trade-offs that our current mechanisms are able to achieve. And do you think your technique uh, bridges that gap? Um, it's a tool for analyzing privacy leakage. Um, what it allows, uh, in, a, in a theoretical way, is to make the bounds tighter. So the epsilon you have to apply, um, it makes it uh, smaller, because you can more accurately say how much leakage you have, which means you need to apply less noise to any algorithm, which increases accuracy of machine learning algorithm. 
this is a one interesting direction to go. Um, but yeah, it's still it's computational uh, expensive, and I guess uh, yeah, I, I hope in the future it will not uh, be that an issue anymore. Yeah. Just wait for one second. I uh, just want to uh, confirm my understanding from your takeaway, I think number three, where you said use Gaussian uh, when possible. Is your point that, I is it that once you have many, many iterations, the delta becomes negligible compared to Laplace? Is that part of the reasoning or? Yeah. Okay. So the delta of Laplace, the Laplace noise is epsilon differentially private, so no right. delta. That's the reason it's so uh, popular. Right. And uh, with Gaussian, you have a delta because the tail uh, falls, um, yeah, the tail behaves differently. But the delta really gets small when you look here. This um, cryptographers uh, think it's secure when you have such a small delta. So I, should, I think it should apply to privacy as well. I understand. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering whether um, it, it I suspect that there is some sort of relationship between the fact that on the many compositions you get um, your distribution ends up looking Gaussian, the central limit theorem, and the fact that Renyi um, differential privacy works better on the uh, on the composition. Um, it, is, is, is there a link between that? Do you have a, an intuitive explanation? Um, yeah, more or less. Uh, when I go back to the Renyi thingy. I think it's uh, so. The thing is, uh, somehow it's all the same, so it's highly connected. And the mo these are the moments of the exponential distribution. And if you take the logarithm of it, you get the Rani divergence, which leads to Rani differential privacy. And the moments um, are, or let's say, the log moments, they on the convolution, they are just added. And that's a connection. So that, uh, yeah, it's it's so popular because it just at the moment there are any divergences. Any other questions for David? Yeah. Um, just wondering if you had um, if you have had a look in, um, in uh, on papers that use deltas in practice. Those do those delta values lie in that range where you think Gaussian is better than Laplace because sometimes those deltas are quite small, uh, so quite large, like about, say, 10 to the power minus 6. Um, so what I provide is a theoretical framework for, for analyzing. I don't, uh, what you actually need depends heavily on, on the system you, you apply. Certain times a delta of 10 is, uh, well, no. <laughs> Certain times a big delta is OK, sometimes it's not. Um, deltas. It highly depends on the subject. I cannot say any number. In machine learning, uh, when, when you invoke a mechanism uh, 10,000 times, then a delta of uh, 2 to minus 80 is still big. Oh, OK, not I mean, two, 2 to minus 20 is still big. Yeah, But if you only invoke it once, it's yeah, not really. So it highly depends on your system. I cannot answer this. All right, let's thank David once again. He was a PhD student at Princeton, currently working at uh, the KB Technology Group in Thailand, and he'll be talking to us about non-interactive differential privacy. All right, uh, first off, I would like to shout out to Samir at the back who lent me the laptop. Thank you, he saved me. <laughs> and uh, I'm back here again. So, okay, my name is T. Uh, Chan Yaswat. I am here presenting a work on Ron Gauss, Enhancing Utility in Non-Interactive Private Data Release which is in collaboration with Chang Chang Lu and Pratik Mittal, who is here. Uh, a little anecdote, the last time I presented at a privacy security conference, the uh, session chair was uh, Nikita Borisov, who was Pratik's advisor. And now my advisor is a chair here. So next time, I'll be a chair of my own session. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, turns out the previous talk is a nice segue into my work, because I touch upon Gaussian, uh, well, not Gaussian noise, but Gaussian in, in a way. Uh, to give a, a little, uh, I want to give a little bit background context of data analytics in privacy context. So in, in general, what happened is 
all of us are data owner. Uh, we, we have sensitive information or, or personal information that we share to, as I borrow from the term in GDPR, a data controller who collect the data and give us some service. However, a lot of times data controller also quote unquote lend out the data to a data processor to do analytics uh, or, or build an app and, and, and so on, which is good in, in the perfect world. However, in the real world, sometimes these data processor or even the data controller themselves can be malicious. So now it become a challenge or, or, or a duty of the da data controller to provide uh, privacy protection. And with that comes many technology. One of them is differential privacy, which is the name of this session. Uh, it is arguably, or it is possibly a gold standard and, and the, the state of the art technology in the regime. And its main philosophy can be summarized as follows. By answering queries, it should reveal very little about any individual record in the database. And specifically to do that, uh, it Differential privacy ensures that the participation of any record in the query system shouldn't reveal or shouldn't change the output too much. And by that, I show it uh, in the figure here on the left side. We have a database with all blue. And if you put a distribution on output, let's say you have a, a blue curve here. And if you replace one record in the database, you get the database on the right, which is a blue and, and orange. Then you plot the distribution of the output again that you get, let's say you get an orange. And differential privacy, you want to ensure that these two distribution should not change too much when replacing only one record. And this is achieved by the notion of neighboring databases, which is exactly what I just described, replacing one, one record in the database and a lot of formal mathematical proof, proofs, which I won't get into, fortunately. Uh, now, However, there are two settings of differential privacy. Uh, the classical one, uh, the interactive setting on the left side where, again, using the term from GDPR, you have data controller who, whose figure here is a database and you have the data processor who use the data for a certain uh, application. Then the data processor give a query to the data controller. Data controller then give a noisy answer to the query. So this is an interactive uh, setting. The other setting is on the right where the data controller have the database, then they do something they call desensitization. So, so they make the entire database differentially private. Then you release that database to a uh, data processor, which can then do analytics. So this work focus on the latter setting, the non-interactive differential privacy. Uh, primarily because it has a, a lot of good benefits. Uh, one, it allows many accesses to the desensitized database for fixed privacy leak. Uh, second, it, it has better compatibility with analytical tools that a lot of uh, analysts would use. Uh, for example, in, in the figure here, uh, the classic MNIST data set of digit on the left, uh, on the right, I give an example of how a desensitized or a, a, a synthesized data would look like, which from perspective of data analysts, they can use it as if they are the real uh, database. So it also provides flexibility and simplicity of usage for non-privacy experts. So they don't have to know much about differential privacy to use uh, differential privacy. However, despite all of its uh, benefits, it has two main challenges, which are quite a big one. First, uh, usually non-interactive setting of differential privacy requires a lot more perturbation, uh, which as a result, you a lot lower data utility. As I show here, again, same data set. If you do uh, a lot of time, more often than not, you when you synthesize data, you get something on the right, which are the digit. Uh, from far away, I can see the five and the seven, uh, but not quite sure everyone would agree with me. So. <laughs> uh, from that, my, our work would like to address these problems, try to enhance the utility of the data uh, that are synthesized in a differentially private manner. We propose a system called Ron Gauss, which, uh, combined to, uh, which has two components. First is dimensionality reduction, and the second is Gaussian generative models. Uh, the reason why we use these components come from the three observations about non-interactive differential privacy. The first one is that usually 
the perturbation level required uh, is proportional to the dimension of the data. Uh, and second observation, directly adding noise to the database often yields pretty low utility. And the third observation is, despite all these challenges, differential privacy has been shown to be quite good at estimating the statistics, uh, 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 summary statistics for, of the database. So from these three observations, uh, we use Ron Gauss because first, Ron Gauss has the dimensionality reduction to reduce dimension of data uh, using Ron projection, which I'll explain briefly what it is. Second, it, instead of adding the noise directly to the database, it used a generative model, uh, specifically the Gaussian generative model, which uh, fortunately is a parametric model, which means you can, instead of trying to, to estimate the entire database, you estimate parameters instead. So that uh, matched the observation three. Now, what is Ron Gauss? Uh, Ron Gauss, the full name is Random Autonomous Projection plus Gaussian Generative Model, uh, hence the name Ron, uh, which I'll, I'll refer to a few times. So Ron is Random Autonomous Projection. Here is the schematics of the system uh, in, in a flow, in, in more like high level. I'll have another one with more detail. So you start with original data, presumably in high dimension, then you do a run projection to project it on into a lower dimension. You get a reduced dimension data. Uh, so here is two dimension. Then you use this data to fit the Gaussian generative model, uh, show as orange ellipsoid here. Then you turn your Gaussian generative model into a differentially private version of itself, uh, shown at the bottom on a, a little tilted ellipsoid here. Then with that, you use the differentially private Gaussian generative model to synthesize the differentially private synthetic data. So that's, that's the whole flow of the system. Now, you might ask why this would work at all. Why problem projection and why Gaussian generative model? Uh, well, first, I empirically, it, it, it works. Uh, but fortunately, we also have a, a theoretical uh, backing in a sense in the form of the diaconist friedman mckes effect or the FM effect in short, which states that for most high dimensional data, their projection onto subspace via this Ron projection uh, often approaches Gaussian. And I, I try to show it on a figure here uh, where let's say you have a high dimensional data and when, when you project it down, it tend to cluster in the middle where the mean of the data is and then, and then the tail tend to be a little weaker, so that, that's where it comes from. Uh, you can think of it as something similar to the central limit theorem, except if, for those who are familiar with the math, central limit theorem usually means you sum a lot of samples, ID. So here, I kind of do the same thing on the feature side. You sum a lot of features uh, on, that, on that end. Now, so this, uh, from Ron Gauss and DFM effect, this is how we apply it uh, in, in a little bit more detail. So you start with the original data. Uh, I show here as, as an X. Uh, think of it as database. Then we do a little bit of pre-processing, uh, including pre-normalization, centering, and another normalization. This is done because based on a theorem by McKess, there is a sort of a, a condition where the DFM effect would apply, and this is done so that it would match that uh, condition. And empirically, it also shows to improve the performance quite a lot as well. So what, once you do that, you, we do run projection, which is a simple linear projection, as you see here. Then you get a reduced dimension data. Then you use that data to, uh, then you compute the mean and variance of that data. And once you get a mean and variance, then you use Laplace mechanism, very classical one, uh, add the noise to the mean and variance. Then you get a differentially private version of the mean and the variance. And with those two uh, statistics, it completely characterizes the Gaussian generative model. So then you get differentially private Gaussian generative model at the bottom. And with the model, you use it to generate your differentially private data. So that's the, the, the whole flow. And uh, the, the privacy analysis kind of follow pretty cleanly from the Laplace, from that of the Laplace mechanism and the post-processing invariance property of differential privacy, uh, which uh, in a nutshell shows that Ron Gauss preserve epsilon differential privacy. Uh, I'll show you in the figure at the bottom here. So you start with the Gaussian model, generative model with mean and, and variance or covariance. Then you add Laplace noise. So you turn these two parameters into a, a DP version of itself. And from post-processing invariance, your, your Gaussian generative model become differentially private. 
And then again, with the post-processing invariant property, the synthetic data from this model is differentially private accordingly. Uh, oh, before I move on to the next slide on the experimental setup, I just want to mention that although I, I, I show the simple Gaussian generative model here, this concept can easily be extended to a Gaussian mixture model as well. So the class of distribution that it covers uh, is, is a lot larger than a simple Gaussian model. And here is uh, the example of a model evaluation we, we have done on, and this specifically actually used a GMM, a Gaussian mixture model. So we show one on, we have a, f a number of experiments you can check out in the paper, but I just want to show a, cl a classification task because it's quite easy to interpret. Uh, the data set is realistic sensor displacement, which is a mobile sensing data for activity recognition with uh, 117 features. The task is to predict whether a particular activity it would cause a displacement of the person or not. And then there are about 200,000 samples for training and, and we left out about 1,000 samples for testing. The setup is, we, is such that we assume the training data to be private, something that we want to protect. And so we train our model, specific, specifically the support vector machine on the, uh, the differentially private synthetic training data. But when, you do it, when we do a testing, we do it on a, a real data. And this is to simulate a situation like a Netflix, Netflix price where Netflix would release their data, uh, which presumably to be uh, DP protected. And then once they get a model from uh, the competitors, they take it and test it on the real data because when they use it, they want to use it on real data. So that, that's the setup. And this is the result of it. Uh, the top row show the performance that if you train and, and test on the real data, you get about 90% accuracy. The rest of the rows are different methods uh, in previous work that use in some way, either uh, some way of generative model or some way of dimensionality reduction. So we try to compare it to, to motivate of why each component of our work makes sense. And all of them use epsilon equals to one, uh, that's the fixed parameter. So you can see at the bottom how Ron Gauss uh, perform very well compared to the original data, uh, pretty small loss. And specifically, it actually signif significantly outperformed competing methods uh, by quite a large amount. And, and again, like I mentioned, by comparing different dimensionality reduction techniques, it, it shows that, uh, or it justifies the wrong projection. And by using GMM compared to the identity, identity model, it also justifies the GMM model. Uh, as a, uh, about to, as a sort of almost a closing remark, I uh, just give a quick discussion point about choosing number of dimensions. Obviously, we we do dimensional reduction, so one parameter would be which dimension to reduce to. There is a theorem by Michaels that would say if we set dimension equals to two log m over log log m, where m is the original dimension, it would data would be most Gaussian. Uh, however, empirically, when we try experiment, it turns out that it might not always true because I think, or at least our, pos uh, our proposition would be that reducing a lot of, by reducing to lower dimension, you lose a lot of information as well. So there's a trade off there. So from what our experiment, we found that in classification, using a number of dimension around half of the original actually works best. Whereas in other experiment, using regression, turns out the number suggested by McKees works best. So in practice, we suggest using uh, cross-validation, a uh, more reliable one. So here's a conclusion and a takeaway. We propose a run call system for non-interactive private data release. It has two components, the dimensionality reduction using run projection and Gaussian generative model. Uh, it, ha it, it, it has a theoretical backing in the DFM effect. And more importantly, it's really simple to implement. We, uh, we want to share GitHub here. If anyone want to uh, clone it and use it, feel free to and give us a comment. Uh, and hopefully, so far, we found it to have a good performance. So hopefully, it's uh, the case. And thank you. Questions for T? So usually in different enterprise, uh, first, thank you for the great talk. Uh, usually in different enterprise, the, the, the later in the process you add noise, the, the better the accuracy is, uh, the same epsilon, right? Global different enterprise works much better than local different enterprise. Mm -hmm. Here it seems that 
uh, perturbating the, the input, so adding noise at the very beginning to create synthetic data, creates better models at the given epsilon than adding noise to the machine learning model itself, so later in the process. Uh, not exactly. The performance control are all the same method, where in some sense you synthesize the data. So, so not necessarily the case. I think those two can combine. I don't know. I th the methods that you compare yourself again, yeah, where yeah, did they the add noise? Did they generate other type yeah, of data? Yeah, they generate, uh, they, sy they synthesize ah. data as well. Okay. So then my question is, how does it compare to methods that add noise at the machine learning stage, you know, like a DPSGD and all of that stuff? Uh, we did not compare, let me try to think. Uh, my, my recollection is we did not compare that to uh, that specific type of application, but usually it's a trade-off between convenience and, and privacy protection. Again, so that if for that method, it, it, you you kind of bound to whatever uh, machine learning method you want to use. So this one is sort of more like a, an, an open uh, uh, setup where you can do different types of analysis at the same time. So that. Any questions? Maybe I missed this, but do you? Um, when you add Laplacian noise, do you have any guarantee that the covariance matrix that you get is um, a positive definite? Or can you? Uh, no, actually, so we didn't, we didn't. So one way would be to add only the the diagonal. Uh, we we didn't do that. So, but well, we didn't do that specifically, which would reduce the uh, the the sensitivity a little bit. But uh, what we wait? Sorry, let me recall. Yeah, that yeah, that's right. But what we did is when we when we use it, if it's if it's positive semi-definite, then then we good. If it's not, usually we, we only use half of it. Uh, but it could be better if we only add half of the noise. Yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I was wondering uh, if you got a chance to um, uh, hear to the uh, hear the keynote uh, which was presented uh, on the first day. And yeah, unfortunately, uh, I, I didn't make it in time okay. that one. But uh, because it no, seems I, that I know it was well. I, I read the report. Yeah, it was great, and I think they had a similar challenge where like um, you have the census data, and then you want to sort of release uh, like s uh, some uh, sanitized version of that. And it seems to me that this could be a potentially very alternate approach because where uh, they look at uh, different statistics and they want to preserve, it's, it's a very complex system they had. Right. But this could be a very alternate way because in some sense, uh, the privacy comes from the fact that it's pretty much synthetic data you are generating as long as you guess the parameters of the Gaussian model, right? And so I think maybe something to look into. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely try to uh, maybe thanks. talk to Simon. Thank you. <laughs> Well, yeah, thanks again. This is really, really interesting work. Um, I have two very brief questions. Uh, you had mentioned and in the last, the last statement that you made regarding the relationship with the uh, dimensionality of the original data. Uh, do you have any idea or have you looked at the performance loss as you go into higher dimensional data? So whether that we've bound the, the number of dimensions that you can drop down to be constrained to like a subset of the original dimensionality do you see a substantial performance loss as that assumption that the reduced data is more normal might be violated as you go into higher dimensionality? Uh, we found we found both. So like so from from here from classification, the curve usually is like bell curve. You go down when you get to half, uh, it, it's good and then it goes up. So that that's the part of we didn't quite understand because supposedly it shouldn't be it should be more Gaussian, mm -hmm. but it's still so we we our assumption is. Uh, information loss is greater, but for regression, we saw the exact, almost the exact same thing, where it, it keep dropping until that point, and it kind of stabilized after that. But usually, that that dimension from this theorem is is quite low. Uh, if you, if you look at a number, yeah, understandably. Um, and then secondly, is there an open source implementation? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So here's that's the GitHub. Uh, if you look Thank up. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe one uh, one final question. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, did you look at, so you have these two stages, right? First of all, the random projections, right. and then the differentially private creation of the synthetic data. Did you look at the change in model accuracy of those two stages separately? So what yep. impact the dimensionality reduction is? Uh, I don't think I have a result here, but we, before we arrive at this solution, we did, we did explore each component separately, and, and it, it, the error kind of goes up pretty quickly without each, either component. Uh, I might have one. Oh, so they sort of cancel out somehow. 
What is it? So they, they sort of cancel kind of each other out somehow. Is that well, what they, they help each other. Yeah. You kind yeah. of need both, yeah. 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 Yep. And did you look at, rather than doing random projections, somehow optimizing the projections for where they were most Gaussian? Uh, what was it again? Sorry. I so instead of doing random projections right. and, and saying that they turn out Gaussian, did you look at somehow trying to project in a space where ah, the distributions came out yeah, most we Gaussian? Did, be before we arrived at this projection, we actually did try PCA and different projections. And again, it, it turns out that the ROM projection worked better, uh, which kind of led us to try to investigate why. And that's in some way kind of uh, when we modify uh, all this condition a bit to, to match the, the theorem. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the pre-processing here kind of seemed trivial, but turns out we did try before without that. Uh, it didn't quite work as well at all. And then we add this, uh, it worked uh, quite interestingly. It worked much better. So, so we, we, from that point, we kind of realized that maybe the, uh, the, there's a, quite a virtue with the theorem, uh, the, the thread called insight to it as well. Yeah. Great. Yeah, let's thank uh, team once again. Thank you. So our fi final speaker is, uh, uh, and he did this work as part of his thesis at Oregon Street State University. Hello. Um, can you hear? Uh, I guess it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Great. Uh, yeah. This is work with Mike and Adam in uh, Oregon. <coughs> Uh, so I'll be talking about the problem of uh, private set intersection. Here, there's typically two parties, uh, Alice and Bob, and they each hold a set, X and Y, and they wish to interact and then learn the intersection of these two sets, but they, the items that are unique to their set should remain private from the other party. Um, uh, so sh it's sort of shown here, I use this diamond box in the middle to represent a sort of a functionality, uh, or a trusted third party, you could think of it, and so Alice or the, I'll call her the sender, inputs her set, and uh, the receiver does the same, and only the receiver should learn the intersection of these uh, sets. Um, and in this talk, uh, so there's many protocols that exist for this problem, uh, and, but in this talk, we'll be uh, looking at, can we add uh, additional uh, leakage or additional output, shown here as LS and LR, which uh, will leak a little bit more information, but we want these, this leakage to enable us to have more efficient protocols. Um, sort of an example of a private set intersection is uh, was recently a sort of published by Google, and here they're using advertising data and sort of customer purchase data to sort of correlate the effectiveness of advertising. Uh, <coughs> and so it could make sense since they're already revealing significant information that maybe if we reveal a little bit more, it would still be okay in terms of privacy. And specifically, the information that we'll be, re re be revealing is uh, differentially private. Uh, no surprise there. Um, and so our contributions are sort of several fold. Uh, we define what it means for protocol to be have some additional leakage. And uh, several works in the semi-honest setting had considered this, but we're considering malicious adversaries, which complicate the definitions. Um, then we present some new mechanisms for uh, histograms, specifically overestimates on histograms, and both for differentially private uh, and this other definition of distributional dis differential privacy, uh, which is slightly different. <coughs> and then we apply these techniques to uh, the PSI protocol that I'll talk about and get like a 2x improvement in performance. Um, so yeah, one of uh, the main challenges here was sort of defining what it means uh, for leakage in the setting. And in MMPC, the typical way we define security is in this sort of real world, ideal world uh, paradigm. And so in the ideal world, right, these parties will just interact with this ideal functionality shown here in this box. Uh, and it just magically hands them back the output. But in reality, right, these parties are going to be running a protocol, sending messages back and forth. And to say our protocol is secure, then we have to show an equivalence between these two interactions. And the typical way you do this looks a little complicated, but it's not too bad, is that uh, we just describe a new adversary uh, called adversary prime. And uh, the adversary in the top real world uh, will be sending messages to the receiver and receiving messages. And in this sort of simulation, or then the proof, we have to describe this other uh, algorithm called a simulator, which 
the adversary will interact with, and the adversary should not be able to distinguish whether it's interacting with the receiver or interacting with the simulator. And what that means is that these messages that are being sent need to be uh, look like they're coming from the sender, but in fact, the simulator is uh, generated without the receiver's input. Um, so that's one part. Um, and an important aspect in when you're considering malicious adversaries is that at some point, at the beginning of the execution of the protocol, the adversary does not have a well-defined input. Like they can choose their input on the fly and not have to follow the rules. And this is different than the Semionis case. And if our protocol is going to be leaky, uh, maybe before the simulator has figured out what the adversary's input is, uh, maybe we've already leaked some information about the other uh, set. <coughs> uh, yeah, I guess I mean, I'll just continue. Uh, <laughs> so the point of the adversary extracting this input x is that then it can be sent to this sort of uh, ideal functionality. And, and since, um, uh, yeah, so the adversary in the real world is interacting with this. And then in the new world, we can have this new additional algorithm called the simulator, which forms our sort of adversary in the ideal world. And that's sort of how we argue that it's uh, secure, is that there's, for every adversary, there's a new an additional adversary in this ideal world. Um, but yeah, getting back to my leak talk, of it, uh, getting back to the leakage is that before we've extracted the adversary's input, maybe we've already leaked information about the other party's uh, input. And so that's uh, what's happening here is that we additionally give the simulator two types of leakage. One, before we figured out what the adversary's input is, and that's this L leakage pre, L pre. And then the, this allows the adversary to sort of sample their input adaptively uh, based upon this initial leakage. <coughs> and then later, we'll do an additional leakage sort of after the protocol's run. And in the semi-honest case, when uh, that had previously been, uh, been examined, uh, this prior leakage wasn't considered uh, because it's not sort of an issue. But it's here we need to be able to let the adversary adaptively choose their input. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, our overall pro uh, sort of interaction would look like this. The adversary first learns some additional leakage, then gets to choose their input adaptively. Uh, we'll run our protocol. In this case, we're running PSI, but uh, we define this model so generally. Uh, and so any sort of interactive protocol could be put here. And then additionally, we allow another phase of leakage at the end. And this is sort of how we model uh, model leakage. And you could analogously define it for a malicious receiver. OK, so now that we have sort of some notion of what we're trying to uh, achieve, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the specifically the PSI protocol that we're going to use. And this was previously introduced by uh, myself and Mike Roslek in 2017. And the basic idea is we're going to use sort of a hash table uh, to start with, at least. And so there'll be some public hash function h. And the sender will hash their, uh, will insert their items into this hash table shown here. And uh, say we'll have like uh, these bins, and what would be n of, m of them. Um, and we'll just do this for each of our items. And so we, for their whole, each of their uh, input set, they just hash it into one of these bins. And the receiver will do the same thing. They'll just apply this hash function and figure out what bin it goes into. And then it's not very hard to see that if for every item that's going to be in the intersection, they'll be in the same bin, just on opposite sides. And so it's sufficient just to compare these, uh, these bins bi uh, uh, each pairwise. And that, w that way we can learn the intersection of these two. Um, but one sort of subtlety here is that the number of items in a given bin reveals sensitive information. In that, like, say the intersection was nothing, there was no items in common, but if you revealed the, how many items are in each bin, you know some predicates about the other party's set. And so to, to get around this, what we can do is we uh, pad each bin uh, with many dummy items. And so if we choose the number of bins to be n over log n, then the expected and overwhelming uh, and the maximum number of items in any given bin is l just log n. And so uh, there's actually no... Um, asymptotic overhead in terms of padding. We end up with still just asymptotically n items on each side. So that's good. Um, and so then the final protocol of this rindal roslek protocol is, uh, yeah, you just hash these bins and then run a smaller PSI within, with 
uh, each bin. I'm not going to get into exactly how they do this, but the idea is that since it's a smaller number of items, you can do something sort of more expensive and uh, qu with like, quadratic complexity. Um. <coughs> However, so the main thing that we are sort of going to address here is that uh, that previous diagram was sort of a little bit of a lie in that uh, the number of dummy items you actually have to add is quite a bit. It's uh, roughly like four times the number of real items. And so the vast majority of the overhead in this protocol was just going to processing these dummy items, which sort of doesn't leave a good feeling. <laughs> and so our idea was, well, since we pretty much know there's going to be mostly just dummy items, what if we revealed some differentially private information about how many real items are in any given bin? And if you follow the differential private uh, literature, this might sound familiar. Um, uh, okay, here's my slide on the definition of differential privacy. We already have had several, so I'll skip over it. But the sort of intuition of how this would apply to us is right, we want to run this protocol, and at some point we'll uh, add some leakage. Um, and we'll be using the, the PLOS mechanism. And so, as we've seen earlier, uh, yeah, and specifically, we're going to be using histograms. Uh, so say we have these loads, uh, and we want to reveal differentially private uh, uh, estimates on a number of items in these bins. And so uh, since the sensitivity, as we heard earlier, is uh, one, if you add or remove any one item from this uh, histogram, that the function, the histogram only changes by one. So what that means is you can take the true loads, hi, and add a Laplace scale by one over epsilon. And that will give us our new uh, noise, noisy histogram. Uh, for example, uh, maybe in this first bin, we'll, uh, the Laplace will come out to be negative two. And so we'll report three items instead of five for this first bin. And we can do this for each of these. <coughs> Uh, and so that's just like a classic, uh, one of the classic uh, differentiated private mechanisms is to reveal histograms. And if we just naively apply that to our setting, uh, we sort of run into a problem. And specifically, say uh, I'm going to use these diamonds to represent the noisy estimates. Uh, say in the very first row, we, the sender is going to report that they only have one item because the Laplace happened to be negative. Uh, but this is a problem in that the uh, sender actually has two items in the spin. And so I guess one thing they could do is just like kick out one of their items, but we don't want to do that. We're trying to compute the set intersection exactly, but add some additional leakage. And so this ends up sort of breaking our correctness requirement. <coughs> and so, yeah, the problem is that these load, these estimates can, under, can be underestimate. And we need differentially private histograms for overestimates. Um, so actually, several works had already considered this. Um, and the basic idea is that you can add a buffer to each of these loads. Uh, say, here we have a buffer of four. And then the idea is that once you add the Laplace after adding this sort of fixed buffer size, um, then you'll always end up with an overestimate. And you, this actually ends up sort of being an epsilon delta uh, type definition, because there's still some pro small probability that it could fall under this uh, buffer. Um, <coughs> But yeah, but yeah, with high probability, all your noisy estimates will be uh, larger than the number of real items. And so that we, when we thought about this, we were like, great. It sounds like we have a solution. Uh, yeah, we can apply this to our PSI protocol, you know, add the buffer, compute the noisy estimates. However, we end up with a sort of a disappointing result in that for like an epsilon of one, the the actual size of these noisy estimates is on average about the same as we had in the standard uh, protocol. And, and this is just comes from, yeah, that you have to add a very large buffer to uh, overcome this. But there's something sort of curious going on here in that, like, some of our estimates, our different private estimates, are actually larger than the a priori upper bound that we had in the previous protocol. So we're, we're sort of estimating that there's more than we know is even possible. So there's something curious going on there. And if you recall, uh, this previous, uh, previous upper bound was derived because we are mapping balls to bins in a r sort of random way. And so this that means the true distribution of these real items follows a binomial. 
uh, distribution. And we, can and we previously had used this to derive this upper bound uh, U. Um, <coughs> and, and then when we did our noisy estimate, yeah, some of them can go above this upper bound. So we, you immediately could just sort of say, yes, let's just round down the ones that go above. Uh, but you can actually do something more clever. Uh, we know that these two variables, fall, one follows the binomial distribution, one follows the Laplace distribution. And so what you can do is you can do like a Bayesian style update of these, of your prior, given this new noisy estimate. And so for each bin, we update our, uh, update our prior uh, <coughs> to compute what's the largest number of items that could be in that bin with overwhelming probability. And <coughs> what this allows us to do is that we end up having, um, <coughs> having our sort of updated priors be informed by the noisy Laplace uh, samples, and all our estimates will be between the true number of items and the uh, actual uh, a priori upper bound with <coughs> uh, overwhelming probability. Uh, and so yeah, our new final sort of protocol looks like this. We use our hi histogram uh, overestimate with these Bayesian updates to derive how many noisy items should be put in each bin, and we report them. And then we run um, <coughs> Uh, PSI uh, for each bin. And uh, as an additional optimization, which I didn't talk about uh, in detail, is that we actually have another mechanism, uh, inner product overestimates, uh, which is a, adds another optimization. And so this sort of falls into our two modeling places where we first leak the differentially private uh, estimates, which allows that can be uh, used by the adversary to adaptively choose their input. Um, and then we do this other, uh, second phase of leakage, uh, which is input independent. <coughs> um, <coughs> and we also present a second mechanism uh, in this distributional differentially private uh, definition of differential privacy. And here we can actually do something slightly different where we just pick this threshold and we either report that the number of items is below this threshold or above the threshold. Um, and that ends up being uh, secure under a slightly different definition. I guess you, I refer you to the paper. Um, but yeah, the main reason why we wanted to do this, right, was to get uh, improved performance out of uh, this PSI protocol. And the question is, what, how did we do? And for an epsilon of like one, we're approximately like twice as fast for a variety of set sizes over the standard uh, protocol, which doesn't have any leakage. But also what is interesting is we, we can tune this epsilon parameter and we can get sort of a performance uh, privacy trade-off. Um, so shown here in this red line is scaling epsilon from uh, epsilon of four down to an epsilon of 0 0.005. And you can see that for all of them, uh, in the ver vertical column is communication, and the horizontal is running time. So for all of them, we're, we send much less data than the standard protocol. Uh, but uh, as we scale up our privacy parameter, it, it uh, increases our running time, and eventually it would uh, just sort of converge into, the communication would converge with the same uh, as the non-leaky version. version. Um, but adding the differential privacy adds a little bit of running time overhead, so you can see why it shifted down a little. Um, <coughs> we can also compare against sort of the state of art in terms of the lowest amount of communication PSI protocol, and this uses the stiffy hellman approach. And you can see with our, uh, uh, improvements were almost send almost the same amount of data as the uh, yeah state of the art and, and uh, yeah with that I'll conclude uh, we sort of define what it means to have differentially private leakage or leakage in general in this MPC uh, paradigm new mechanisms for these overestimate histograms which can be applied to these other prior works and then we show how it can be applied to private set intersection uh, yeah that's all. Questions for Peter? Hi, uh, thanks for the really great talk. Um, you explained earlier that uh, you the previous work on differential private PSI was only focusing on the semi honest use case. Uh, it was actually not for PSI. It was for like, similar problems, but not yeah. Uh, so uh, my question was, uh, did you compare with this uh, semi 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 honest approach in terms of performance and running time? But if it's not the same, the exact same problem, maybe not. I see. Um, yeah, they they were uh, yeah slightly different problems. 
And yeah, it, and in the semi-honest case, there's like protocols that are very fast without dummy items at all. So it's what didn't make sense. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for the great talk. It seems. Um, so you have this issue where like um, you have a distribution when you do the balls and bins problem like you have some distribution over there and um, reducing that with uh, like while keeping like so you want to maintain the privacy aspect of it but like also reduce the sizes of that i was wondering if um, if you have looked into how does that quantify um, sort of the leakage because now um, in some sense there's semantic meaning in some sense of leakage because if you know that a particular bin has like three items you know that um, you can, and if you if you have a database with four items, you know all four of them cannot be in in that. Like if they hash to the same value, so uh, some studies on that that aspect of this. Um, in terms of like, so yeah. So so if you really did just have three item or four items, uh, then the, pro the then you'd probably had to pad up to four. Uh, but if you had like a million items, mm -hmm. it's extremely unlikely that all million items would go to the same. Bin, and that's sort of like this, what this binomial distribution captures is the, what's the maximum number of items. Yeah, it makes sense. I think that you're uh, pretty much like, I think you want, uh, you're almost doing faster, like the sizes are still close to logarithm, I'm guessing. Like, so yeah. Less than and so. Yeah, they're like three log n yeah, versus so three five log n or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any other questions for, for Peter? Right, great. Uh, this concludes our session on differential privacy. Let's thank all of the speakers once again. Okay. Very interesting work. Uh, good. Intersection of differential privacy and